okay. Um, well, if you if you mention all these things, it sounds as if I do all those different activities at the same time, which is not the case, of course. I I, I did that in the past years, and presently, and that's that's what my talk is about. Presently, I'm um, started a year ago uh, with a, a project, a bigger project, funded by the. Um, uh, the Dutch uh, NWO, which is the same as the FWO here in Belgium. Um, and uh, this is actually about authority. And what I'm going to do is, well, to more or less explain a little bit um, what the project is about. Uh, at least that's, that's the kind of uh, the topics that we, we discuss. I will, uh, I will deal with them. Um, and I'm, I'm very boring. I'm just, I, I don't have a nice PowerPoint with nice pictures. I, uh, I used to do that, but um, I'm, I'm now going to, uh, to read a text and I will do that not very quickly. We have two hours and I, I don't know what the, the format is. Yeah. Uh, so I think I, I, I need no more than maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes, I think. Well, you never know. but. That's more or less the time I need, and then we have enough time for discussion, hopefully, and questions. Okay, so indeed, <clears throat> the title of my uh, of my talk is "Making Islam Work." This is actually the title of the project. And if you're familiar, I don't know what your background is, but uh, if you are familiar with um, uh, uh, Robert Putnam, who once wrote a book. Uh, making democracy work, and we thought, well, this is a nice kind of brain picking. So we took that title and we, we changed it a little bit. Making Islam work. It is about how things work, the, the practice of, of of making Islam. Work. Thank you very much. So um, the subtitle is religious ethics everyday experience and the making of religious authority. So our assumption is that these things have to do with each other and I hope to explain that in my, in my talk. So, um, beginning of this year, uh, the, the attacks in Paris, you all know about it. I was in Indonesia when, when it happened, so I only later on uh, really dug immersed into the, uh, into the situation uh, here in Europe. Uh, but also in Indonesia, it's the front page news, I can tell you. So, one of the, uh, one of the things that happened in the aftermath of these uh, attacks was the quest for explanation and meaning. Um, and in my view, this has brought to the forefront uh, one single issue into the debate, and that is, that is the, 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 the issue of representation and authority in Islam, in, in this case. Uh, one of the main questions that were addressed uh, after the event was whether or not Muslims, it must have been happened, this discussion must have been taken place here as well, uh, whether or not Muslims support uh, the attacks and if not, why there is so little public protest against it. Now, well, I do not agree um, in this last, uh, with respect to this last point, um, this is certainly wrong, many Muslims reacted. Uh, very negatively on the uh, on the attacks, but the question in whose name the perpetrators acted and on whose authority will be one of the most pressing issues in the years to come. So, if you want to understand how Islam will develop, <coughs> that's my thesis, my, my my kind of argument that I try to elaborate. You have to look for uh, the making of authority. How, how, how authority comes about, how religious authority comes about. This is a very central issue at stake. Um, and of course, this not only holds true for very dramatic and high impact events such as the attacks, it arises in the <coughs> wake of globalization and, even more importantly, uh, uh, together with globalization, the growing diversity among Muslims. Europe. Again, I come to that in a while. And so, globalization, diversity, religious authority, these are very much connected to one another. 
So the rapidly growing diversity, not least among Muslims in Europe, prompts us to address the question, what is meant when referring to Muslims in Europe, or European Muslims, um, when they act, especially when they act publicly, you know, when, they, when they reach out, so to speak. <coughs> the way to go in a post-secular age uh, and to overcome the kind of totalizing and homogenizing assumptions uh, that, that are still present, uh, especially with governments. And governments in Europe want Muslims to be domesticated, kind of develop a national Islam. And uh, this is not going to happen, uh, in my view. Um, and they have to come to terms uh, with the conditions of um, what Bob, Bob Heffner, an anthropologist from the United States, called the deep pluralism. And that's something that characterizes many European societies. So it's not just, I mean, diversity is, is a general uh, characteristic of societies, but I refer here to Muslim communities, or what, whatever you call them, the people with an Islamic background. So it is not just a matter of diversity in, in a sociological and economic sense, uh, a growing kind of dissimilarities between positions in society, but it's especially also relevant to look at uh, the question, and I posed that earlier, who speaks for Islam? Who is speaking in the name? So let me give you one example. There is, uh, there is an imam in one mosque in one city somewhere who says, according to some people, very uh, terrible things. And then this is immediately taken up by, well, in, in, in my country, uh, people like Geert Wilders, but increasingly also the kind of the whole right wing political spectrum is taking that up. This, th th these kind of arguments stand for Islam. Well, what I'm not going to do here is a kind of apologetic way, uh, in an apologetic way, refute that. What I'm, what I'm arguing is there is no one single truth in Islam. And that's, I think, what is at stake. That's something we, we really have to, to take into, into consideration. And it doesn't help, as many kind of mainstream Muslims tend to do, say, well, you know, look in the books, look in the, uh, uh, look in the scriptures, then you find the right answer. This is not the point. It's not the point about what is in the scripture, what is in the text. It is about what people do with it. And if you have a um, sociological or anthropological background, you know what I mean. This is, this is about, you know, society is made by people and people do things also with written text. So understanding, interpretation, guidance and authority are thoroughly entangled with societal circumstances and embedded in political and societal context, always. Who is to decide what is proper knowledge, proper religious knowledge, and what is right guidance? What is meant by an Islamic community? And what is the role of, and this is in my view very important, lay Muslims and Muslims who are not professionally uh, doing something with Islam, Imams or, or any other personnel, lay Muslims. Yeah. We use the word ordinary Muslims, but there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of discussion about that term, lay Muslims. Um, so what is at stake here is the contextuality of authority and knowledge production. Um, how are we to characterize the order to which people submit? Where is the locus of power? And these questions must be addressed if you want to understand how the Islamic landscape takes shape and develops. And there is, the, there is much, much a societal and an organizational question as well as an ethical one. And I think that last point, uh, the ethics of this all, is very crucial, very, very uh, central. When Muslims across the world declare publicly that acts of violence are not Islamic and not committed on their behalf, they implicitly or explicitly comment on issues of morality and critically engage with Islamic normativity and authority, a certain Islamic uh, normativity and authority. So religious authority refers uh, to theological legitimacy, 
and persuasive powers. And so the question is, who has enough legitimacy, uh, uh, legitimacy to say, well, this is the way to go. Right? Follow the leader, follow the authority. And again, this is not <coughs> something that you can directly, that directly emanates from the script. This is something that ha has to be articulated uh, sociologically, that has to be put in, in a kind of societal context. If you, if you have quite, if you say, oh, I can't follow you, please uh, interrupt. Um, so the production of knowledge and leadership, what, which are kind of part of this, this, this broader concept of authority, um, this is a domain where uh, the negotiation and power are central uh, constituted processes and where tensions, but also innovations, in Muslim communities become manifest. This is where it happens, where it starts. And again, I come to that in a while. So the global dimension of Islamic leadership is probably the most sensitive issue in contemporary debates on Islam in Europe. And there are many indications that the authoritative and institutional frames of Islam in European countries, which have, has been, have been developed under migratory conditions, uh, by, by migrants, are under pressure, are in a kind of flow, in a kind of change. There are all kinds of initiatives uh, in many countries to set up institutes for religious learning in Europe or to develop organizational structures beyond ethnic dividing lines, so not Turkish, Moroccan, what have you, Pakistani <coughs> organizations. But also the rapidly increasing, and you probably uh, know about them, the new independent preachers who are particularly popular among young Muslims uh, are an indication of change. And again, you see that governments are very uh, worried about these, uh, these people, especially in relation to the whole discussion on, on, on jihadism and <coughs> radical Islam, radical. So, um, the recent developments in the Middle East and the support among a part of the Muslim population for IS, for the uh, Islamic State, and uh, attempts to recu uh, rec recruit young people um, in what they call holy war in Syria and Iraq has become a major point for concern. <coughs> Islamic, and, and not only by governments and, 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 and uh, host society, uh, but also by Islamic scholars and theologians uh, and all kinds of opinion leaders. There is a constant debate going on. If you go to mosques, it also, in, in this country, you will see that it is very much at the heart of the debate right now. What's going on here and how can we avert, how can we, in a way, um, come to terms with this. So, religious leadership, community representative, cultural brokers. Let me, let me give you a little bit of a kind of historical picture because I think that's important to understand uh, these changes. So, if you would look at the, the general religious landscape, um, I'm, 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 I'm working um, on this issue for almost, sounds very old, almost 40 years. Uh, so, um, I already uh, uh, was involved in all kinds of research um, in, the, in the late 1970s. And if you compare the landscape uh, in, let's say, the early 1980s, but, but even also uh, 15 years ago, uh, the conclusion would be that the picture was very clear and, and, and un unambiguous, very, very straightforward. Yeah? There were uh, Muslims with strong family um, ties, uh, and the religious practices were rooted in uh, the country's origin. So it was clear. <coughs> in a way oriented towards the country of origin. And mosques were run by Muslim organizations that had their origins in the home countries, often controlled by headquarters there. Now, I don't want to say that it doesn't exist anymore. The point is, this was the picture that, um, well, that we know from, let's say, 25 years ago. So political and doctrinal dividing lines followed a similar pattern and religious authority was in the hands of traditional ulama. And, and many of these people, it was not very clear or it was not very 
obvious where their religious authority was based on, but at least it had to do with their with these these uh, these ties with the country of origin. So it was very hard to disentangle what is at stake here. It, but it was clear that this was very much linked up with migration uh, situation. Okay. So, in the last two decades, this picture is beginning to change and beginning to, to distort and, and to, to, uh, um, well, to, to develop in, in, in new directions. Organizations have changed their policies and their activities. The number of mosques and religious organizations that are not organized along ethnic lines has increased sharply. And a considerable number of young people no longer get uh, uh, go to ordinary ethnic-based mosques or have abandoned Islam altogether. That's, of course, also what is at stake. While others opt for a more, uh, again, I don't, for want of another term, a radical variant of Islam. I, again, as I said, I don't like the term radical because it, it's it, it's very confusing and 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 and, and brings about all kinds of mistakes. So they explore new modes of expression of religiousness and piety. And this had had a tremendous effect, um, uh, impact on the established ways of conveying religious knowledge, as I just told you. And so, so what you saw happening in, in many mosque organizations already from the, let's say, first half of the 1990s was uh, these kind of debates uh, about what is the way to go, and especially young people had different opinions about um, how to set up uh, and how to, 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 to organize um, <coughs> Islam. So one of the things that happened, and this is especially uh, uh, observable since the early 2000s, is what is called the fragmentation and the pluralization of religious authority and knowledge production. So a pro process of fragmentation multiplicity of, of forms, um, and especially also the role of media, modern media in that. So although the but, <coughs> so th this is a process that, that can be observed, but although individual search for knowledge in, in, in new media may certainly have contributed to the fragmentation of authority, this does not necessarily mean that authority has faded, and this is a kind of general misunderstanding that I come across many times. So individualization of religion, eh? the, the, the privatization of religion, that's kind of the, the secularism thesis, uh, means that people develop a kind of copy-paste Islam, do-it-yourself uh, religion. Eh? Everybody has his or her own religious conviction. And um, uh, and then authority is not necessary. You can, you can go to the, to the sources directly. Well, this is a big misunderstanding and it should be emphasized over and over again. It is true that religious authority does no longer emanate automatically from relatively stable religious congregations, but that does not imply that religious authority have become obsolete as a result of individualization or uh, of religious practices and beliefs. The assumption that the situation in the first decade of emigration was stable, right, the, the, the decades I, I just described, suggests that authoritative relations were self-evident and undisputed. And this was, of course, not the case. I mean, authority is always based, as I said in the beginning, on context. And this was and what happened is that the context is changing. So the basis, the sources for religious authority are changing. Um, and they have to be reconfirmed continuously. This is a kind of ongoing process. Yeah. Um, in the case of Islam in Europe, the influence of government policies on migration and integration, as well as the relation between the state and religion, were and continue to be crucial in this respect. So this is partly, uh, this is part of this context, but there is more to that. Um, and now I'm going to address a little bit more specifically the situation in, in the Netherlands, but I think there is no big difference. I, I know the situation in this country as well quite well, and I think that the difference is not very big. Right? So, so what, I'm, what I'm 
telling now is, is, is pretty much also the case for Belgium, in my view. Um, so, since the vast majority of Muslims uh, in these countries have a migrant background, um, issues of integration, minoritization, and not least political and cultural controversies largely determine how political decision making evolves and how religious freedom and religious equality take shape. So what you see until the end of the 1970s is that cultural and religious background of migrants didn't play any role for governments. People were, the idea was they, they are here uh, just only temporarily, so they will return and what they do in their uh, leisure time and, 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 and in their homes, that's not our concern. And even there were all kinds of programs, uh, you know, cultural language programs to, uh, to keep people connected to the country of origin in order not to alienate them from, from the country of origin um, um, so that they could return um, uh, as soon as, as possible, preferably. Well, oh, it didn't happen, as you probably know. Um, the number of Muslims, the number of migrants grew, especially uh, through family re re reunion, and it altered the urban landscape considerably in the, in the 1980s. So very soon you see that there is a need for qualified religious personnel. And so the, 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 the kind of building up of a religious infrastructure took place eh, already in the 70s, but it really took off in the 1980s, um, and uh, again, um, uh, the idea was that this is mainly something that <coughs> will be organized by uh, a strong link with the home countries. So I give you one example. Um, uh, I, uh, indeed, I, uh, I, I recently published uh, a kind of an overview of, uh, of Turkish uh, uh, Islamic organizations in Europe. And the biggest, also here, is the uh, Dianet, which is very much linked to the Turkish state. Well, in, in 1983, and I, I can't remember exactly in what year it happened here in Belgium, uh, there was an agreement to send imams uh, from Turkey to here uh, to work in mosques. And this was welcomed by governments here. They said, well, that, that's good. We can't do that, so, so you do that. Well, 30 years later, this is considered the main problem, you know, the long arm of Ankara and that kind of talk. So you see what happened in, 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 in 30, in three decades. Anyway, um, I, I'm not going to deal with that now. Uh, we can discuss that maybe later, but uh, let me continue. Um, so so um, uh, what happened then, um, and I think this is a very important kind of early process that took place in the 1980s was uh, there, there, there were migrants, migrants, uh, uh, Muslims with a migrant background, they didn't speak the language, they were, uh, they, 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 they came from other countries, they were strangers uh, in Europe. And so very soon in the course of the 1980s you see a kind of leadership emerging among Muslims, um, a specific mode of leadership. Um, mostly people who had lived here at that time already for quite some time, the, the really early, early uh, migrants, and they acted as intermediaries. They said, well, you know, uh, we know these communities, you don't know them, they don't speak the language, so we can act as a kind of brokers, kind of, kind of in between. We can translate, literally, but also um, uh, virtually, uh, translate their wishes. And that's what happened. So what you see in the 1980s in Europe is the emergence of this, this kind of broker, uh, uh, Islamic brokers. Let me, let me call them like that. Uh, um, and what these brokers actually did was emphasizing the foreignness of Islam. They said, well, you know, uh, these people have a, have a, a, a religion, they, they come from abroad, they are strangers, and they have a religion that is strange here. So, 
In fact, I, I, I call that in an article I wrote a couple of years ago, the enclavization of culture and religion. So, culture and religion were made into a kind of islands, kind of, you know, uh, enclave. Uh, I don't know the, it, it's not an English word, but enclavization is an English word, I'm sorry. Anyway, it means it means making islands, you know, making making the kind of it had nothing to do with society and the the boundaries between communities and the outside world were were reinforced, were were emphasized rather than, than broken down. And it was emphasized also that these people uh, live in exceptional positions and that there, there were exceptions, they were not part of mainstream society, they were exceptions. And of course, also the idea that religious authority, that's what we're speaking about, was a matter of the countries of origin. It was very much linked to these, to these cultural religious islands. So what you see then in the course of the 1990s, and again, I'm, was a, what I call a fundamental shift in the political agendas of many Muslim organizations. So from this kind of foreignness enclavization strategy they gradually and, and at some point uh, very quickly uh, moved into another direction by stressing the fact that Muslims were part of the new society and instead of being foreigners being part of this world. Again, this is an agenda. This is not about uh, what, was, what was happening on the ground, but this was the agenda. Yeah? And there were two reasons for this shift in my view. The one is the increasing upward mobility, uh, despite all these figures, we 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 are they are thrown at us uh, from all sides that um, Muslims are still in a kind of low position. This is absolutely nonsense. It is nonsense. There is very good research going on right now uh, in many countries in Europe that shows that there is a very quick upward mobility going on. Of course, there is, relatively speaking, people, well, not Muslims, people with a migrant background uh, are still in a, in a, in a kind of uh, weaker position, but there is a very quick exchange going on. And everybody who, in a way, tries to refute that, they, they, they really misunderstand what's going on. So this is very important, upward mobility, and in a way seeing people with the migrant backgrounds in all sectors, all, all parts of society. That's very important. You probably have witnessed that here too. Um, 20 years ago it was a, absolutely an exception when you would meet uh, Muslim women in, in lectures like this. Absolutely uh, a, a, a unique situation. Today it's very common. Huh? But there's more, more in the case. So this is very important. <coughs> so what you see is there is an upward mobility and Muslims are becoming more visible in different ways. This is very important. And of course, this is, <laughs> this is part of it, the whole orientation towards the country of origin has changed. There's, there's no country of origin. I know many, many Muslims who well, well, people with a, a, a Muslim background who uh, went back uh, to Turkey, for example, and many of them, uh, they, they really feel sorry for doing that. They, 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 they realize that Turkey is a tough society. You know? It's not, I mean, it's not like here. It's it, it really hard to, to get a job there and to, to, to get a good position. So what you see is that although it doesn't mean that people embrace societies here, they uh, orientate on, on, on society. This is, this is a very important uh, point. Um, and this all had a tremendous effect, and I'll come back to my, to my topic, on the authoritative relations uh, in Muslim communities. I, looking at the time, I must hurry a little bit. Um, so, as I said before, uh, traditional forms of religious knowledge and, 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 and knowledge conveyance did not match anymore with the like worlds in Europe. And again, this is not new, it's something that we hear already for years. Young Muslims in Europe more than ever feel the need 
to reflect on the origins of their religion and reconcile them with their experiences, which are not anymore rooted in countries of origin, but are rooted here. So the complexities of modern urban life, in which a majority of young Muslims live, requires specific competences by religious uh, authority. I mean, people, people who, who, who act as professionals need to have these competence, this, this knowledge. And they need to, in a way, uh, develop a sensitivity for what's going on here. Um, but then also modern media play a decisive role in, in this whole process. And again, this is, this is not new, and I think that has been discussed in this series lectures before. This has not only, so what you see is that on the one hand people are rooting here, on the other hand, through modern media, you see a kind of a globalization of religious affairs. This, this, is, this sounds paradoxical, but this is uh, uh, localization and globalization uh, go hand in hand. They occur at the same time. It's part of the same uh, process. So what you see is that um, that on the one on, on the side of of this new generation, there is a need for kind of new uh, interpretations, and on the other hand, uh, on, from the side of the the leadership, you see that the new publics, uh, that, that, that that traditional leaders are not able to address adequately uh, uh, young Muslims. Okay, so. Fragmentation of religious authority and knowledge, I, I, I just uh, uh, said that, um, are very important, but that doesn't mean that authority, looking for authority, um, has faded away. Um, young Muslims also seek guidance to develop new notions of belonging and new notions of, of, of piety. However, the circumstances and conditions in which this takes place are fundamentally different from those in the early days of migration. So consequently, the sources for the making and the remaking of religious authority have changed, and today these sources uh, are more diverse and unstable than ever before. So what you see is that all in all, uh, the fragmentation uh, process has unsettled religious, traditional religious authority. And it's interesting, I work together in a number of um, publications with a theologian, and we, in a way, we compensate. I'm, I'm, I'm very much, I, I very much emphasize that this change is going on. And he says, "Well, if I look around me, I don't see it." And I said, "Well, then you, 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 you don't look uh, correctly. I mean, then you have to look at different things." And indeed, he is right to a certain extent. There is still the, 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 the kind of traditional networks and power relations are still very strong. And again, if I look at the Turkish community in Europe, we have to admit that the, 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 the existing organizations are very strong. And all kind of experiments that you see more among Moroccan Muslims than among Turkish Muslims has to do with uh, well, this, this, this kind of organizational strength, so to speak. But also among Turks, there are things changing. Okay. Um, let me see, where am I? Yeah. So, okay. So, this is the picture. And let me now go a little bit deeper into this making of authority point. Because um, um, if, you, if you look at religious authority, if you look at... Um, uh, at, at, at questions about uh, uh, who is entitled to speak on behalf of Islam, etc., etc., these kind of questions, there is a tendency, and especially among people, uh, theologians and, 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 and Islamic scholars, there's a tendency to emphasize on uh, scholarly text and on scholarly debates, and so debates between professions. And the role of of ordinary Muslims, of lay Muslims, as I said in the beginning, in the making of religious authority and leadership is neglected. But it's very important to understand how this comes about. What is their role in the making of Islam? 
Um, so it's one of the most, I would say, understudied topics uh, in study of Islam in Europe. Um, um, uh, the role of ordinary Muslims and especially their everyday experiences. How they, how everyday experience of people are linked, are related, uh, are inform, so to speak, religious debates. Um, and this is a constant dynamic. This is something that is constantly going on. Um, religious authority making is, uh, is not just an imposition of normative frame, as we, as we tend to think, and to ordinary Muslims, but it's also a bottom-up critical reflection on these authoritative frames. Uh, people question uh, the, authority, the, the, the legitimacy of certain, uh, certain explanations. Well, the point is, historians of Islam and theologians can study how doctrinal developments in Islam have taken place by analyzing theological sources, fatwas, and other religious documents. And with the rigorous historical and hermeneutical methodology, they can lay bare how changes come about and how Islamic theology evolves. However, they focus predominantly on the material produced by religious experts, canonized commands, authoritative documents and scholarly debates. In other words, they study the very top end of the dynamic. There is hardly any insight, especially historically speaking, into religious activity of non-experts in the process that leads to doctrinal change. There may, there may be scholarly reflections on certain ethical issues, but there is virtually no evidence about the role of non-professionals. So the idea is then, if there, historically we don't have this material, we don't know what happened, say, 200 years ago in religious innovation. We don't know how it started. So we tend to think that it is a scholarly issue and not an issue of ordinary Muslims. Well, our, in our research, our hypothesis is there must be also 200 years, also 500 years ago, there must have been a debate, something tension, frictions, debates going on in order. This is a hypothesis. It's not, I mean, we, we, cannot, we cannot prove that because we don't have the material. Nobody has the material. There's, there's a few, one, one interesting book, but that's also rather recently, that deals with uh, Islam in India in the 19th century, in the early 19th century. And, and, and the, the author of the book, Green, he tries to the name of the book, Islam Bombay, well, I forgot about it, but he, what, what he tries to do is on the basis of all kinds of documents, what kind of discussions took place among non-professionals. Okay. Um, so it tends to be ignored uh, in, many, uh, in many, and that's, that's, that's understandable, as I said, because there is no, no information. Think about fatwas. You know what a fatwa is? A kind of authoritative religious uh, 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 decree. Um, this is not something that emanates directly from the sources. This, has all, this is also always informed by discussions. I mean, it doesn't mean that people always put question marks on what happens. But if you assume that there is never a question mark, then I think you misunderstand what's going on. You, you ignore the societal kind of embeddedness of these kind of things. Okay, so what happens then? If you, if you take this a step further, then the argument goes that um, if people put question marks to authoritative frames and, 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 and degrees and decisions, uh, they in fact put questions mark, question marks behind the legitimacy of authority. And this is where I, well, where we try to start in, in this research. And, and again, I think that this questioning authority is a very important uh, issue uh, that will become more important in the coming years. Um, but again, don't we, we should not argue that uh, Muslims, young Muslims today are always putting question marks. Eh? Um, 
religious practices are predominantly reproductive. You, you, you follow normative frames. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. However, precisely where Muslims find themselves in changing social conditions, situations of liminality, it's an anthropological term from, from um, Victor Turner, and wish to, li to live uh, pious lives in accordance with established traditions, frictions, ambiguities, and dilemmas emerge. And so, um, so um, precisely because you try to follow normative frames, uh, moral breakdowns can occur. If you don't do that, they will not occur. They occur at the point where there is a kind of a, a clash, a friction. But this is also the point where inventiveness and new ideas come. And this is, I think, a very um, fascinating process going on now, but it's very hard to, to find that. <coughs> okay, so, um, how does that work? Take two Muslims, one living uh, his or her life, uh, uh, all, all his or her life, in a tiny remote village somewhere, uh, somewhere, I don't know, somewhere in the mountains of Morocco or, or Turkey, whatever, and another one living in the big city of Europe. May, they may refer to the same normative friend. This is just an example where you see that this cannot be. They, they cannot arrive at the same conclusion. It's simply not what happens. They refer to the same normative frames, but they, they have built up completely different ethical reference schemes on the basis of their different experiences. If one shares these experiences with others, a process that has been altered tremendously due to the use of modern media, we come closer to a reflection on the very authoritative status quo. This is kind of, now we are back. This is, this is how it works. Uh, hopefully you, you still follow me. And I, 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 I come to a conclusion. Let me just um, uh, end with a few um, issues we, we address in this research, because that probably makes it a bit more concrete. Um, so, there are many indications that the critical reflection is taking place, as I said, among a growing number of young Muslims in Europe, and maybe already for a longer period than is often assumed. But it is very much invisible, because not just because it is not something that is very widespread, but also because it is sensitive. I mean, if you say this imam uh, is talking rubbish, well, that's... You know, that can be, that's not easy to say, especially when you say, well, I'm, I'm a simple guy, you know, I, uh, I didn't uh, study Islam, so I don't know. In that kind of situations, people may easily assume, oh, I know, I have the authority, and I can tell you how it works. So that, this, is, this is a sensitive issue. Um, However, there seems to be a strange contradiction in the way society and politics perceive critical en engagement of young Muslims with established normative frames. So what you see now is a very interesting kind of paradox going on here. Young Muslims are critical. And that, that criticism doesn't mean that they only embrace society. It also means that they say, well, the hell with this society. Uh, we go fight in Syria. We may, don't, we, we may not like that, but this is part of being critical. critical. And this is not just being critical to <coughs> the whole society, it's also critical towards established religious authorities. But we should not, in a way, uh, uh, swing to the complete other side and say, well, this is all young Muslims are potential uh, radicals or jihadis or what have you. This is part of a very broad spectrum. And this is what's going on. On one hand, there are worries. So what is the, what is the, 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 the paradox? On the one hand, there are worries about the established organizational landscape among Muslims in Europe, on grounds that they should inhibit uh, integration, and that they, they, in a way, frustrate integration into whole society. That is at least the worries of the Dutch government. I wrote a report on 
Turkish Islam for the Dutch government and uh, and the question was well they, they these organizations they, they in a way block integration so th this is the worry on the other hand uh, there are even more worries about young Muslims and a quest for new religious experience that question this kind of establishment. So it's a very strange situation. So <coughs> many local initiatives set up by Muslims to see how certain elements of Islamic law could be applied in a whole society in which, which are officially declared secular and where Islam is still supposed to be a religion of migrants and not of permanent inhabitants have been branded as attempts to gain control over European institutions, and even initiatives to root Islam in local society and to develop Muslim communities beyond ethnic dividing lines often meet with suspicion. This is very paradoxical, I mean, by government. Um, so, for example, if you take the campaign Not In My Name, I don't know whether you're familiar with that, launched in social media in 2014 by British Muslims, was supported uh, massively across the world, but it was also heavily criticized because it was seen as a way to evade the question of representation and involvement by simply arguing that the atrocities committed by, uh, by Islamic State are not Islamic. So, if Muslims say, this is not in my name, they are criticized. So, uh, this, is, this, is, this must be very confusing, a kind of critical, uh, a different kind of contradicting requirements, um, and in, in practice that, 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 that doesn't work very well. So concerns about the influence of Islamic leaders are enhanced because many of the current leaders are prominent, highly visible, uh, focal figures that appear in the media, media regularly. You probably know them. I'm, I'm not referring only to our famous uh, Tariq Ramadan, but there are many more, street fighters, everything, the whole lot. And they uh, so, so, this is part of the Islamic landscape today. Um, so, there are a number of fields of contention uh, and friction where we may expect in the coming years to witness contestation, initiatives, innovation, uh, and all kinds of well, new ideas uh, coming up. The first field is what I term the halal market. And this is a very broad term, don't misunderstand me. Um, it's, th this is a term that, that might, uh, uh, might uh, suggest that I'm, I'm uh, exclusively speaking about consumption or food. But it's much broader. Consumption in relation to religious norms and regulations in an ever-widening field of debate and commercial and religious activity. The initiative by Muslims to develop a so-called halal quality mark, which is the case in the Netherlands, I think that, that there, there's a discussion going on here too. Yeah? So, just as we have these, uh, you know, the quality marks, of, of eco or um, anything, you know, that it's if you if you see that on the on the outside of a product, you're sure this is okay. That this it should be a kind of official. Um, uh, mark. Um, this is a very intriguing case because the point is that it's not just, well, that's very easy, you just uh, produce these kind of products and you put this halal stamp and then you're done. No, it's very much entangled. There's all kinds of discussions about, about you know, um, how big would that, that part of the commercial market be and how does it work, etc., etc. But apart from that, um, um, it, the, the halal implies much more than only food prescription and ritual slaughter. It's about the expanding global market for an increasingly wealthy, pious middle class. And again, check that out. I was in Indonesia, as I said, in January, and I went to a, a number of bookshops, and there is a, an increasing number of books with titles such as Middle Class Muslim food priorities or something like that, you know, or uh, there is a whole, you know, uh, young, uh, young female Muslim uh, fashion uh, kind of, you know, products and all that. It's, it's booming, it's very big, and especially in Southeast Asia um, and in other countries where they, uh, middle, Turkey as well, you see a, an emerging market for 
uh, wealthy people. Fashion, self-styling, consumer goods, art, entertainment, and what have you. Um, so it also includes, in, in our research, we also look at um, activity of young Muslims in the sphere of leisure, peer group relations, entertainment, sport. And so, for example, one of the little projects we are working on is a very interesting initiative in the city of Rotterdam of young Muslim women who want to exercise, do training, you know. And then they, they, they want to be pious Muslims. They go to the local imam and they do, and they say, no, 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 no you're not allowed to. Well, what, what, what a nonsense. So what you see, they, 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 there was an issue here. They, they created a debate. You know, more, more women uh, uh, are uh, taking part and it's really becoming something. Very interesting. This is the kind of issues we want to address. However small, they are important. They mean something. And there, 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 there are all kinds of things going on there. Uh, or uh, a... Um, a halal, what was the word they used, I forgot, kind of, you know, um, uh, secondary school um, um, kind of nightclub thing, something like that. I forgot about it. We, we, we are going, to, we are going to, uh, to, uh, to deal with that in a while. But these kind of things, yeah. it, it, it concerns issues where Muslims are part of everyday life in, in this country. This is one field, so th that's, that's what we call halal. It's more to give it a name, uh, but it's more broader than just halal. The second field deals, a field deals with the position of new religious leaders who seek new audiences and build new religious communities. So it is very much about community leadership. The legitimacy of these leaders continues to be a sensitive issue, and not just the cyber imams and the wandering preachers, but also people that are uh, local leaders. Uh, you, you probably know, or maybe not, uh, in, 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 was it in Antwerp? Um, Abu Jaja was in Antwerp. Yeah. So th th this came out of a, uh, of a protest in a neighborhood. And then you also see community leaders emerging, and part of them have a kind of religious agenda. So we're going to deal with that. Um, and then, of course, and this is, this is I would say the most sensitive uh, issue that we address, um, and that's the application of Islamic law. Now, if you use that word uh, in Europe, uh, this, the, the famous S word, you know, there's very many people who immediately say, "Oh my God, you know, Sharia, it's the kind of the, 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 the kind of most frightening uh, issue that you can imagine." Um, my, uh, my colleague uh, at the University of Leiden, who was interviewed by METRO, you, you, there's also METRO here, I think, eh? this, 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 uh, this free newspaper in the in train. He was interviewed about whether or not uh, uh, kind of parts of Islamic law Sharia could be applied. He was threatened to death, you know, just by saying, well, you know, asking, addressing this question. This is a very sensitive issue. But it works. Um, in the Netherlands, we have this very interesting program, um, and it's called uh, the Rijder en de Rechter. I don't know how many of you speak Dutch. Well, it's a it's 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 a nice program. If you speak Dutch, go to the Dutch television it's every week. What you see is neighbors having a quarrel about you know a fence or a little shed or whatever you know, or the dog is shitting and. Uh, all these kind of things. And so this 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 rijdende rechter means the, 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 the wandering judge or whatever you call it. And what he does is um, he 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 acts as a kind of intermediary, as a kind of um, counselor in these kind of conflicts. And I know um, that uh, the people, the parties have to sign that they <coughs> that they uh, that they accept his decision in the program. So what happens is you see uh, what is at stake, uh, and then, then there's a discussion, and then at some point he comes and he said, well, uh, I, I, I went through the case, and this is my judgment, and this is what you have to do with it. Um, and 
this is actually what also happened with this Sharia Council. It's not a matter of parallel legal systems. It's simply people say, well, you know, uh, we want to divorce, but we want to do that according to Islamic law. So the whole council and the whole idea of asking for advice on these kind of issues, family issues and all that, um, um, I rather, I, I prefer to have a verdict of somebody who, who, who is well, who is experienced in Islamic law rather than, than somebody else.